Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Fed Profits Macro webinar today. Um, Patrick Ganley, along with Angus Geddes, as usual, every two weeks. So, Angus, how are you today? Good, thanks, Patrick. Um, we'll get through some housekeeping items first. Um, pre presenters, as usual, on the um, on the macro webinar, Angus, founder and CIO, Patrick Ganley, chief operating officer. Um, just get some housekeeping items out of the way first. Please be reminded that all the information presented today is on a general advice basis. And uh, before acting on any of the information or recommendations, um, you should consider consulting a financial advisor before doing so. Um, also, please be reminded that past performance is no indicator of future performance going forward. Um, comments and questions, you will have the opportunity to um, post some comments or questions to us during the presentation and we will endeavor to get through as many of them as we possibly can. Please see the orange arrow where you can type the questions in and then we'll get to them as they come through. If for some reason you cannot hear the presentation today, um, a couple tips here, check the volume on your PC, check the speakers are plugged in, check your headphones, check the sound settings. But if you're still having issues, please give us a call, 1-300-8811 double seven. So without further ado, we'll get started. Uh, Fat Profits macro update. Angus, it's been an interesting couple of weeks in the markets and we thought we'd start with this slide and you. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we've um, we've had this decent rebound off that big sort of 5,200, 5,100 support level during the, um, during the volatility spike uh, earlier this month. Uh, we're following the volatility spike, and I think um, you know the the, the S&P 500 is moving up. It's moved back up towards its um, its record highs. But I think you know valuation is now stretched um, once again. Um, we've got um, the next reporting season to to get across, uh, which is coming up uh, in October. So that that sort of follows obviously the the September quarter. And you know, traditionally we're moving into a seasonally weak period for the market. So um, you know, I think now is probably a good as good a time as any just to perhaps raise a bit of cash um, and just anticipate that we could have some more volatility. I think uh, you know, heading into September, October, which had traditionally been quite you know quite volatile months. What would cause it? Well, I think you know one. Um, you know, the bar of expectation for uh, earnings season in the US is pretty high. Um, so if there's any disappointment around that. Uh, plus we're also getting, you know, reactions to to some of those, um, so some of those data prints that um, are sort of coming through on a little bit on the um, negative side pointing to a, you know, a slowing US economy. You know, I think um, whilst, you know, the US is still tracking uh, for a soft landing, and there probably won't be a, um, uh, you know, there won't be a recession. Uh, certainly not this year. Um, we just need to be mindful that, you know, um, any deterioration in those unemployment numbers uh, will have the market sort of worried about um, whether, you know, the Fed is behind the curve or not. We know that interest rate cuts are coming. Um, we've got the Jackson Hole summit this weekend. Uh, where Jerome Powell set to give the keynote speech tomorrow, uh, and the way you know it's looking in the bond market is that you know we are on track for the rate cuts, but you know is it going to be 50 basis points in September or is it going to just go, going to be 25? I think the other point to mention is that you know we've got quite a lot of uncertainty around the U.S. election. Uh, it's going to be quite close. We don't know uh, whether it's the Trump or uh, Harris who's go who's going to prevail uh, in November. Uh, and they've got quite different contrasting uh, policies that they're going to be pursuing, which have diff diff you know, different implications for the market. So we've got to navigate that as well. Uh, I'm not looking for those big support levels to be breached, um, but I just think there could be another leg to this uh, this sell-off that started uh, in August. Um, and you know, markets typically retest their lows, so it wouldn't be wouldn't be surprising at all. Um, you know, if we if we did see another sort of a 10% correction at a retest of that sort of 5,100 or even the 5,000 uh, support level. 
uh, but I don't think um, the US market is in danger of going uh, much below those levels uh, anytime soon. Okay, you touched on um, <clears throat> investors and markets. We'll be looking at um, Jackson Hole over the next couple of days and Jerome Powell's speech. Um, what are you expecting to come out of that, Angus? Uh, look, can we have the next slide? Yep. Um, so what, I've, what, what I think is going to come out of it really is, um, I think there'll be a couple of, couple of things that come out of it. I think Jerome Powell is going to endorse um, and put a seal, you know, a seal of approval on the fact that uh, the next move in interest rates in the US is down and that, you know, all things being equal, that's going to happen in September. I don't think he's going to say whether they're going to go by 25 or 50. Um, but, um, you know, that uh, inflation uh, is on a downward path back to target quicker than they anticipated. I, I expect them to say that the US economy is still resilient. Um, and whilst they're, you know, they're watching the labour market, they still think that the US economy is continuing to expand. Uh, and I think he's going to play down the, the risk of a recession. Um, but in terms of the bond market, uh, what we can sort of see here on this chart in terms of the technical setup, since that primary uptrend, the green line was broken uh, at 4.2%, you know, the 10 year has fallen back to 3.8. So I'll be watching that closely and how the bond market reacts. You know, you know, all things being equal, um, you know, we could probably see the 10 year uh, come back a bit more and possibly even uh, test that 3.3% level, uh, you know, in coming months. So I'll be watching that quite closely um, and how the bond market reacts. Um, there shouldn't really be any surprises as, as it relates to the equity market, other than the fact that, um, you know, I, I, I think that power will push back on that growth scare that, that caused the jitters in the stock market a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, Hello. Angus, and you, you've, you've doubled down on a um, high conviction, high confidence secular bear market call for the greenback. Yeah, can we have the next slide, please? Yes. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we do see, um, look, I, I've been negative on the, the dollar all year, uh, and I've been wrong, you know, for probably the first half, we actually saw the US dollar strengthen. Um, but, you know, the resistance has been pretty formidable from that sort of near-term downtrend. And we've seen the, the uptrend, uh, the lower green line broken, uh, and the US dollar index has fallen quickly back to that big support level at 101. Um, so I think, look, near-term, uh, we, we could see a rebound in the greenback. Um, you know, it's a big, big support level um, at, at 101. Um, so I think all things being equal, um, I think the Jackson Hole summit comes and goes. Um, Power probably endorses, you know, rate rate cuts, but doesn't commit to how much and when, um, other than, you know, the first one will be in September. You know, if anything, we could see interest rates sort of lift a little bit and maybe, you know, maybe that causes a rebound rally uh, in the dollar index. Um, but I don't expect it to really go much uh, above 102, 103. You know, you know, I'm expecting a retest of 101 uh, later this year. And, you know, our base case is that the dollar, uh, the US dollar is now in a secular bear market. Um, and that it's going to break below those levels uh, at some point. Uh, you know, I think it'll happen before the end of the year. This is a non-consensus view. Most of the investment banks are still bullish on the greenback, um, but it, it is quite telling uh, in terms of what we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, some of these other major currencies now really breaking out and inflicting higher against the greenback. You know, the euro, the technical setup there looks pretty bullish. Same, same goes with the pound. Uh, and if we pull up the, um, the next chart, 
uh, you know, even the Chinese remember is firming, uh, has firmed in recent weeks against the greenback, which I find staggering, given that you know the central bank of China has cut uh, their policy rate to two percent, well below the US. It's the only one of the only major central banks that are uh, that are cutting aggressively, um, albeit you know the ECB and the Bank of England, etc., have, have followed. Uh, but they have been aggressively easing for some time now. And of course, you know, if we look at all the headline news and the negative sentiment around the economy, uh, what the economy is doing, you'd think that the currency, the currency would be going down against the greenback, not up. So this is telling, and I think this is sort of points to perhaps, you know, further sort of systemic weakness coming through the US. At the moment, I think the, the dollar weakness has really been driven about uh, expectations on interest rate, narrowing interest rate differentials. You know, US rates been coming back down faster than uh, say the Europe and the UK and Australia. That's putting upward pressure on, on major currencies, the Aussie dollar, et cetera, and downward pressure on the US. But I think as we get, get into the end of the year and certainly into the next year, I think it's going to be about structural issues and the, the rapid rise of the US uh, national debt, uh, the fact that fiscal spending uh, is unlikely to be reined in by either political candidate in terms of who wins in, uh, in November. And you know, I also think the um, cost of servicing that debt is, is going to come into focus uh, now that uh, all the old debt's been rolled off but the Treasury has been replaced by new debt and that new debt carries a much higher interest rate and a much higher interest coupon. So yeah, one, one to watch, the, the, the dollar. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next chart here. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, you know, we made a sort of a high conviction call of the Japanese uh, stock market, uh, which had the biggest decline since 1987 was priced for recession, you know, and that's far from the case. The Japanese economy is not in recession. In fact, it's got healthy inflation and, and, and decent real growth for the first time in a long time. Um, you know, it was interesting, um, you know, I had a long chat to and listen to a presentation the other day on the Japanese stock exchange group, um, the Japan exchanges, which owns the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And, you know, I think, um, the bull market in, in Japan, while, while tested, is, is still very much intact. We might see the top X, which, which had a big bounce off that 2200 level. You know, it might do some backing and filling before breaking above 2700. Um, but I think, you know, there's nothing really that's, that's going to get into, in the way of this, um, this bull market uh, that, that's, that's unfolding uh, in Japan. You know, it's the first bull market really in 40 years. Um, you know, and some of the reasons to be bullish on Japan, you know, the Japanese government is stimulating the, uh, the population to encouraging them with tax breaks, et cetera, through a, a NISA um, account to uh, invest in Japan, which they're doing. Uh, we saw a lot of Japanese buying from the public uh, following, the, uh, following that big, big, um, that big sell-off that was triggered by the short covering rally in the yen. Um, and we've got rising return on equity in Japan. You know, Japanese corporates have the lowest amount of gearing uh, of all the major OECD uh, economies. Uh, and that's actually allowing a lot of these Japanese corporations to uh, drive buybacks uh, and launch new buybacks, um, which they are doing. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of positive factors uh, and I think this bull market's going to go for some time. We might see some consolidation now, but I think that 2,700 uh, will probably be it over, over the short term, you know, as we move into September, October. But I expect that that to be uh, surmounted before the end of the year. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd expect the topics to be retesting those record highs uh, within sort of six, six to nine months. Okay, so fundamentally, you think we're out of the woods with that bloodbath and that big decline we saw about uh, 10 days ago? Yeah, I do. I don't think uh, the, US, the Japanese market's going back to 
the topics in the index is going back to 2200 any time soon. I mean, it was a complete outlier event. The Japanese stock market declined in three days. You know, the, the magnitude was similar to what we saw in the 87 crash. Um, yet the fundamentals for the Japanese economy hadn't changed at all. A lot of this was driven by positioning and the fact that a lot of hedge funds and investment banks and traders, etc., borrowed Japanese yen to buy international shares and Japanese shares. Uh, so I think we're probably 70, 80 percent through that. Um, and that, you know, Japan, Japan, which is still about, you know, near 10 percent down from its peak, I still think there's, um, there's value in that market and, and, and opportunity. But um, we'll probably wait till September or October uh, in case, you know, we get some volatility coming through. We've already had one bout of it in, uh, in August. Normally, you these sort of sell-offs, there's a second lag and, and the markets tend to retest their lows. And I think we'll probably see those August lows for the US market retest September, October. That's my sort of base case uh, over, over the next 10 weeks. And that'll be a good time, Patrick, uh, to deploy a bit of cash uh, because I don't think there's any sort of sign of a, a bear market anytime soon. Not in Australia, not in the US, uh, and, and certainly not in Japan and uh, Europe and, and the UK. Okay, over to gold. Yeah, so gold's been doing as we expected, you know, it made a new record high on the back of US dollar weakness. And I think, you know, this sort of thematic has got, it's got more, more to run over the next six months. And um, we've seen, you know, a nice sort of consolidation uh, with gold sort of it reasserting into record territory. It's near near record territory uh, in terms of Australian dollars. Um, and, um, you know, so far, you know, I think um, this, this bull market has, has further to run. It took, you know, four years really for gold to get above 2,000 an ounce. Um, so all things being equal, this upside move could have more in it. You know, I think 2,700, 2,800, uh, you know, even an overshoot to 2,900 is plausible, you know, over the next sort of six to nine months. Particularly if we're right, we get that US dollar systemic weakness coming through, um, you know, in the second half. Okay, over to our next chart. I thought this chart was interesting because you know, we've got gold breaking out to new record highs in Chinese renminbi. We know that you know a lot of the Chinese public see gold as a, as, as a good hedge, particularly you know given the uncertainty that's going on at the moment in their own economy and you know property prices still falling. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see demand out of China reassert, uh, you know, given this this breakout, but also financial flows around the world begin to pick up. Uh, and move back into um, move back into bullion. So uh, you know you might recall that you know a lot of what drove gold to record highs in the first half of the year were uh, uh, investment flows from the central banks. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that comes back with a vengeance in the second half, particularly now that the you know the US dollar is looking pretty weak. Um, but also financial flows coming from the private sector. Uh, I think we're going to see retail investors not just in uh, in China, but sort of around the world, begin to start put money back into some of these um, gold, silver, precious metal mining ETFs, uh, and also the physical metal itself. So we've noticed major currencies are breaking out on the upside against the dollar. Uh, back in the day, gold was an age-old hedge. Um, do you see gold continuing to play this role? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, I put um, it was interesting, sort of writing up what what an ounce of gold would buy two thousand years ago, back in Rome in the Roman Empire days. Um, you know, not much has changed. Um, you could still pretty much buy the same sort of goods for the same amount of gold uh, today in terms of what 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 one ounce will buy. So. Um, yeah, I think, look, it is a hedge. 
um, certainly the central banks viewing it that way, and I think it will come back into vogue with the retail public. So, you know, I think um, you know this bull market has got further to go. I think the precious metal equities themselves are still screening pretty cheap. You know, we've had some pretty good profit results coming out of the sector. Northern Star reported today they they had a um, a, a big increase in profit. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I continue to see opportunity there uh, with valuations still, you know, very cheap relative to where they've been historically. And, you know, the fact that the, the retail sector, it's haven't really put much money into the sector yet. They're very, very under-owned. So um, maybe, you know, I think we do a big catch up really in precious metal equities, you know, over the second half and, and into the next year. Okay, so we'll move to Australia now. Yeah, I think the ASX 200 is is is, is looking pretty good technically. You know that that 7,600 support level, which we've been talking about for some time, that was tested. Yes, we could see that tested. Um, you know, in in coming months. Um, but look, the bull market in Australia is very much alive and I think it's early stage. I think the index goes a lot higher over the next few years. It's important really to emphasize that the economy is not the stock market and the stock market is not the economy. Um, and to illustrate that point, I want to talk about 2008. Um, and as we all know, Australia didn't have a recession, 2008, 2009, um, yet the stock market lost half its value. It took about a decade for it to get back to 7,000 and sustainably move above that even longer. Um, whilst I think there's a very big risk that Australia has a recession uh, within the next six months, and we can talk about that in a minute, I don't think the stock market's going below 7,600 in a hurry. Um, and a lot of that will be driven by, uh, by the fact that valuation is um, is, is still screening pretty cheap, certain, certainly for certain sectors uh, in the market. And, uh, you know, so we have a lower level of valuation. Um, and, you know, we've got some companies that are actually doing extremely well, um, despite, you know, the economy being quite tough. Um, you know, the economy is not the stock market, the stock market is not the economy. So I think the, the bull market um, gathers momentum uh, into the end of the year and next year as, as we get closer uh, to the point where the RBA cuts rates. Now, a lot of the a lot of the investment banks don't believe and economists don't believe that we will get a rate cut this year. UBS is saying it's not going to happen until the middle of next year. I, I can't see that. I, I think the RBA will move before Christmas time. And um, I think our unemployment, our, our labour market will deteriorate a lot faster than the US between now and the end of the year. And I think, you know, the economy is wobbling. Discretionary spending um, is really drying up. Um, you know, people are really struggling out there. Households are struggling and they're scrimping back. So um, yes, when, on the one hand, we've got this inflationary problem in Australia, um, but like the US and many other countries around the world, you know, I think inflation is going to start coming off quite quickly here. Uh, those inflationary pressures um, that were around a year ago, six months ago, I think, uh, you know, looking forward, they're just not going to be there. So the disinflationary trend uh, will become a bit more entrenched. And I think the, the, the RBA are going to have to really worry about the labour market because, um, you know, I think unemployment could, could really start cranking up, ticking up quite quickly. Deloitte's um, uh, economics did a... Um, quite an interesting survey and they found that in the private sector are just not hiring. And if anything, there could be 100,000 job losses next year. So, um, you know, I think there's credence to, to the research that they put out. I think the economy is in a, in a, in a tougher way domestically than in the st statistics, the official st statistics suggest. So, um, yeah, rate cuts starting at the end of the year, uh, unemployment, um, rising unemployment, putting the RBA under a, a lot of pressure, but downtrending inflation, giving them a window to go in December. Um, 
and the Australian stock market to continue to climb a wall of worrying and, and what is a new bull market. I think this chart is, is really interesting and it sort of says it all. It really took the ASX the better part of, of 16 years to really sustainably move, move above that 6,800 resistance level, which, which was the peak back in 2007, 2008. It's been successfully tested during uh, the, the vol purge of a few weeks ago. We might see it retested, but I expect the ASX to continue climbing uh, into next year. So, you know, any volatility that we see September, October would be a good time to be putting some spare cash to work. Okay, as we always do, we'll now um, <clears throat> switch from some of the macro stuff and we'll um, touch on a few stocks that we, um, we've been focused on and we'll start with this one here. Yeah, so I know, look, I know the mining sector um, are contentious at the moment. Um, my view is that these big primary uh, uptrends in Rio Tinto and BHP, these big support levels are going to hold and we're probably seeing these stocks bottom out now. Now's not the time to be selling. I'd, I'd be a buyer um, and, you know, we might see these big support levels retested uh, you know, September, October, but I do expect them to hold. Um, and, you know, our base case is that uh, iron ore prices will reassert to the top side in the fourth quarter. I think, you know, some of these marginal high cost producers are going to have to start shutting down now. Um, they can't compete, obviously, with the likes of BHP and Rio, which have got, you know, um, um, uh, much lower cost operating costs at sort of $30 a tonne. Um, so I think, you know, the market starts to, the iron ore market starts to right itself. Um, you know, and we can see a similar technical setup for BHP. You know, the, the, these are big support levels. BHP and Rio, very strong balance sheets, lots of cash, the big dividend payers. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I, I think we're probably through the worst of the, um, the corrective sell off for these stocks uh, you know which has been quite quick so talking to evolution mining uh, this is an interesting one we've seen um, this is actually a little bit out of date now um, this was from earlier this week evolution has actually broken above that 420 resistance line uh, it's taken a while for that to happen you know the stock's done a lot of backing and filling um, within a big trading range between 23 and 24. And we've only just really seen the stock clear that resistance level at 420. So it's sort of trading at 436 uh, as, as, as I'm speaking now. And I'd expect this to become a, a big floor now for the stock uh, and for topside momentum to, to continue and reassert. Uh, I think, you know, the next, uh, plausible targets of four dollars eighty and sort of five dollars forty. Uh, looking looking further out into next year for evolution. Okay, we've got one more stock. I know you wanted to talk about. <clears throat> yeah, evolution is an interesting one. Um, one that's really not covered by any analysts uh, and brokers. Um, they've actually got quite a solid balance sheet. Um, and some very valuable assets, and of course, no debt and lots of cash in the bank. Uh, I think this is uh, a stock that's been completely missed by the market. Um, and they've got a number of um, precious metal assets which uh, are in the pipeline to be sold. And as these asset sales come through, I think the stock re rates. You know, we've seen uh, St. Barbara break out of a sort of a primary downtrend uh, and re re you know, rush, re rate quickly to 30 cents. I think uh, the stock's going to retest those levels, you know, in coming months uh, and perhaps move quite a bit higher uh, above that level. Um, you know, if we're right in our view that the gold price has got further to go on the upside. Okay, one other stock that I, I know you've been interested in recently. Yeah, Ansel, I thought they, they had a great profit result. Um, you know, this, this earning season, has been marked by dispersion. You know, anyone coming out with poor guidance or missing earnings have, have been punished. 
uh, equally stocks that have done well are being quickly re-rated. And we saw a decent upward dynamic in Ansel this week after they reported. Um, I liked what they had to say. You know, they were talking about costs out, automation, reducing their workforce by 10%. So taking a lot of, a lot of costs out of that business. Um, and they, they're now, have got real momentum. Um, this whole consolidation and the big sell-off from $42 down to a low of sort of $20 looks to me now complete. And, uh, you know, I think we'll see some consolidation, but I think upward momentum is returning uh, to this company, which is, which is doing quite well at the moment. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, that'll move us on to some questions. Um, I think it's earlier in the um, presentation, you spoke about raising some cash and having the cash ready to deploy um, when the time was right. And you're talking kind of September, October. Got a question, if, if you were fully invested and you were looking to try to raise some cash, are there any particular sectors you would kind of lighten up on at this point in time? Um, look, I think now's a good time to be pruning pruning back your share portfolio. It's a bit like, you know, as we head into head into spring, um, pruning your portfolio, just looking at some of the st specific stocks that have underperformed. Now's a good time to be to be sort of getting those out, you know, getting rid of the, some of the stale holdings and uh, and raising some cash and um, you know, and just sort of getting ready to um, to redeploy if we get an opportunity to go and um, in October, you know, as I sort of said before, you know, we had quite a brutal sell-off in the um, first half of August. And stock markets, you know, typically retest their lows and a correction. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if we saw the US indices do exactly that. Uh, and, and also even for the ASX to, you know, to retest that 7.6 uh, level uh, in, the, in the months ahead. So, um, Look, I think it's more of a case by case basis. Um, uh, you know, like, and you, you know, you've got to take tax into consideration. So everyone's in a different position. You know, the bank stocks have had a decent run this year. They could easily come back 10% or more, you know, in September, October. But if you had CBA and owned it at $5, it wouldn't make any sense be offloading it now and then trying to buy it back 10% later and paying all that tax. So you've got to take your tax into consideration. Um, I probably wouldn't be taking too much off the table with the precious metal sector either, um, given that you know the gold price is at record highs. Uh, it didn't really react too much during that big vol purge. Um, we saw the gold stocks hold up really well when, when equity markets around the world came under pressure. And we know that they're still screening really cheap um, rel relative to, you know, in terms of valuation and in terms of uh, relative to spot Aussie gold prices, spot US gold prices. So probably wouldn't be trimming there too much um, and, and just focusing on some of those specific stocks that are underperforming. Okay. In relation to the Japanese stock market, which we, which we spoke about a bit earlier, is there any way to play the Japanese stock market um, through the ASX? Look, there's ETFs um, that, 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 that uh, hold a basket of Japanese companies. That's probably the easiest way to play it. Um, I wouldn't do it today. We've had the big rebound from those lows. The market's gone from the indexes of, you know, the topics has gone from 22 back to sort of just under 27. So I would wait for a reset into September, October, and then look to deploy. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think it's going back to 2200 to retest those lows, but, you know, we might see the topics back at 25, 26, um, you know, to a couple of hundred points lower, which would provide a better, better entry point. Uh, and ETFs are a good way to play it. Um, you know, for those that just don't want the stock specific risk, you know, you can just, you know, buy the index uh, and get set that way. It's it's as good as way as any. And you know, if if there was a bit of a reset, um, you know, down to 2600, you know, and then the, you know, the index gets back to 2900 and sort of 3000, 3100 by next year, 
you know that would be a uh, you know quite a good um, quite a good result, um, and you'd see that, see that reflected in the ETF, which which hold a basket of uh, Japanese companies. Is there a specific ETF that you would look at? Um, I, I would probably just go for a, a general one over the Nikkei or over over the over the topics, which has sort of broad based exposure. You know, and our contrarian fund, we've we've still got a lot of exposure to the Japanese financials, um, and I'm still bullish on those because I think Japanese bond rates and interest rates are going to continue to climb, looking out over the next year, which has to be very positive for the um, you know for the Japanese banks. Okay, and with silver and gold um, here in Australia, would you be playing that um, at the stock level, or would you be looking for an ETF? Well, we're doing it at both levels. Um, you know, I like um, I like the GDX and GDXJ because they give you a broad-based global uh, basket and exposure to to you know some of the leading gold mining companies and some of the leading mid-tier gold mining companies around the world. Um, and ditto for SIL, which is the, uh, the Global X Silver Miners uh, ETF. Uh, and you can sort of take out the stock specific risk and, and just worry about what the pressure, the underlying spot precious metal is doing, um, which, which is good. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty bullish on some of the Aussie golds as well, Patrick. You know, the evolution, the well diversified in terms of their mine portfolio, uh, they scream cheap. Um, on a price to MPV basis, they've got some copper exposure. Uh, they've, they've diversified there. Uh, Northern continues to kick goals uh, at the smaller end. You know, Saint Barbara screens cheap. Um, you know, so it, you know it's hard to turn you back on the Aussie golds as well. Uh, and I think they're still really underowned by the by the market. Um, so when they're running, when they're running, the, the catch up rally. Uh, and the catch-up follow-through buying from uh, investors that, are, that are really don't have any representation there could be quite significant. Okay. Earlier we spoke about BHP and Rio, and I know we don't have a chart on this one. Do you see Fortescue in the same kind of basket as where Rio and BHP are at the moment? I do. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, Fortescue... Um, Fortescue is not quite the same as BHP and Rio for, for a couple of reasons. You know, one, um, uh, the Pilbara deposits of Fortescue have got, you know, the, the, the con concentration of iron ore, the, the quality is not quite as good as what um, BHP and Rio have got. That, that's one point. But I think the main one is that, you know, BHP and Rio are diversified. You know, they've got, they've also got a lot of copper. And we are bullish on copper. Uh, you know, I think um, you know there's been a bit of a shakeout and a correction in the copper price, but it's it's drifting up nicely now. Uh, I reckon the lows are potentially in. You know, and we know that the world's going to be using a lot of copper during the energy transition uh, and the eight coming wave of AI. You know, that's real. All these data centres and upgrades to the grid and transmission lines that need to go in and the data centers and then connecting those data centers are all going to require a truckload of copper. So, you know, whilst, you know, the, probably the market's a bit bearish at the moment, you know, I don't think you can go past BHP and Rio. But yes, Fortescue does look interesting. It looks cheap at these prices. Um, you know, I know one high profile fund manager the other day swapped his BHP for, uh, for FMG. Um, you know, in terms of the way I look at it, you know, I'd rather I would rather hold BHP and Rio for the copper, um, and um, but you know, you can make an argument to hold all three. Okay, Collins Foods. So Collins Foods issued a trading update. Uh, they said that um, you know they're getting uh, they're still getting same store sales growth in this in their in their store network. Uh, in Australia and around the world, but uh, in Europe, but they're getting cost pressure as well, which is going to impact on margins. Um, I think the sell-off in Collins is, is potentially overdone. You know, the stock's down 11% today at 782. 
uh, and I'll, I'll issue a technical update on that tomorrow. But um, yeah, I think there's potentially a major buying opportunity coming in there. I mean, this is a, a very resilient, uh, a very resilient and defensive um, fast food chain. Uh, you know, with the KFC franchise, the company has a history of delivering. And um, I'm looking, I think if we look through where the Australian economy is, is at the moment, and obviously, you know, this discretionary spending has been hit hard, um, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, although we haven't seen it show up in same store sales growth, which, which was still higher, uh, for the 14, 15 weeks trading update uh, into, into August, uh, obviously that's going to be impacted. And, you know, Australia could have a recession. Uh, a lot of this is now all priced in. And what we want to be focused on is um, when the RBA is going to be cutting and when we get that inflection point in the economy. My, my sort of high conviction view is that the RBA will be cutting by the end of the year and, uh, and that um, uh, a recession um, we, we might have passed through that recession, you know, by the first or even the second quarter of next next year, uh, in which case these stocks will all be a lot higher well before that. So Collins is sensing the next six six months, um, but then we go through an inflection point. Um, and they're, they're high quality, you know, it, it just um, staggers me that Guzman and Gomez, which uh, have listed trading at $33, they have 180 stores in their network. Collins Foods have five or six times that number uh, in Australia and overseas. Uh, KFC is just as resilient as, as, as Guzman and Gomez. Um, you know, yet, yet Collins is selling for a fraction of the multiple. Uh, and if you divide market cap by stores, um, you know, Collins sells at a fraction of what Guzman and Gomez does. So yeah, I don't think three, three over three billion plus valuation for 180 stores is is realistic for Guzman and Gomez. I don't really see you know 33 dollars as being rational, um, and I think Collins has completely overdone it at 784 today. You know, down 11 percent. I think there'll be a major buying opportunity uh, in that stock. Do you have a, do you have a view on energy pricing over the next six to 12 months? I think, um, you know, energy pricing, you mean, are we talking electricity or are we talking? Um, well, we, talking man, we, we, we got a question oil? in here really talking more about Woodside and Santos. Yeah, well, again, you know, I mean, look, Woodside has been, been the underperformer. I think Santos has held up um, a lot better. Um, and clearly, you know, clearly China's a big importer of oil, oil prices have have sagged to you know, 73, $74. People are worried about the Chinese economy. So we could put them in the same basket as the iron ore producers. Arguably, you know, they're sort of reaching a, a bearish extreme already and, and factoring in a worst case scenario. Um, look, I've read some reports that LNG, uh, there's gonna be a supply glut there, but you know, energy prices recover and then everyone's talking about the energy transition and how LNG is going to play a huge role uh, in helping many countries um, get get away from um, you know more more toxic more lethal fossil fuels such as coal so you know again I think um, you know I, I think this this sort of sell-off that we're seeing is probably close to the end rather than at, than at the beginning and you know, I've sort of got a high conviction view on um, um, I've got a high conviction view on the iron ore as well. You know that we might see iron ore overshoot down to 85.90 short term, but that doesn't mean to say that Rio and BHP are going to come off anymore. Uh, markets look ahead. Um, we'll probably see some more supply cutbacks uh, in, in energy, as we're probably going to see in iron ore, and you know that sets sets the market up for recovery. You know, in the in the fourth quarter of this year and into next year. Okay, and with reporting season, has there been any surprises you've seen so far? And and, and what are you looking at, looking for with the rest of the reporting season? Uh, look, I think Australia, yeah, there have been a few surprises. You know, we talked about dispersion before. 
uh, it's been hit and miss. You know, Megaport reported today that's a, um, sort of an IT technology company that, that is widely followed. You know, they're down 10%, they missed. You know, WiseTech were up yesterday because they beat. Um, so we've had a lot of that. Uh, I've been surprised at some of the retailers. JB Hi-Fi um, had, a, had a very strong set of results. Harvey Norman did all right. Very surprised uh, that the retailers have held up given the pressure on discretionary spending. And I'll probably put a lot of that down to the fact that you know immigration is, is probably keeping that, that end of the discretionary spending market uh, buoyant for now. Um, and um, yeah, so you know, dispersion, there's been a lot of dispersion. Um, and um, but probably I would say some of those retail results were the, were the most surprising. Some of the, 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 the ones that the market reacted very positively to. Okay, so that's that pretty much wraps it up today. We hope all the members, we thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Angus, as always, thank you. And I guess all eyes on um, Jerome Powell and um, his speech in the next few days at Jackson's Hole and, and we'll see how that'll um, impact the market in general. And without further ado, we'll say bye for now and we look forward to talking to everybody in a couple of weeks time. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.